So how is it? What mechanisms lead us to parse these sentences and to understand them and understand their syntactic structure? Well, one approach is known as the syntax first approach. And the idea is that um, the initial parsing of a sentence is actually fully derived just based on the principles of grammar itself. Meaning we don't really pay much attention to what is being said to the meaning of the individual words. We just pay attention to the fact that, okay, the first word I got is a noun, the second one is an adverb, the third is a verb. So we pay attention to that so that we can build the trees because remember, the rules of grammar apply to categories of words, not to individual words. So we just need to spot what's the category of the word, and then we, we start build this, uh, building this um, um, a representation of how each element fits in there. Um, and so this is, this is one approach. And, and one way, one aspect of this um, is the so-called late closure principle. The idea that the way in real time in which we are processing sentences is that sort of we build, we start building this tree and every new word that comes in, you know, as long as it makes grammatical sense, we kind of attach it to the tree that we've, that, that we've been building up to now. So imagine starting at the, you know, at the beginning of a sentence, as you start hearing it or reading it, you start populating this tree and every new word, you just try to somehow attach it to this tree that you've built in your mind. Uh, and this is why garden path sentences are so interesting. Take this garden path sentence. It's going to appear right here. Read it as it comes up. Okay, so you, you, can, you can see instantly what's happening. Right, you, probably what happened to you is um, if you take the syntax first approach is that you're reading, as you're reading this, you are creating a certain tree. In fact, you're, you're creating a tree um, here. Um, as you read the man who whistled tunes, you're creating a tree where there's this, um, this noun phrase where you're thinking, okay, there's a man who's whistling tunes. And, and this means that in your mind, you, you're expecting, right? The next thing that should happen is a predicate. The man who whistled tunes is a good friend of mine. The man who whistled tunes is really tall, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And yet you get pianos, <laughs> which makes no sense. Right? It, just, it doesn't fit in the tree that you've built so far. So you have to go back and you have to reparse this whole tree. So these type of sentences show, right, expose this type of mechanism where we're sort of building a tree and then suddenly that doesn't work. And so we have to go back, sort of, we cannot just add by late closure the next piece, pianos, and we have to go back and reparse the whole sentence. So under this view, all that we're doing is we're paying attention to the grammatical categories of the words as we read, and we, we fit everything together. And then once we fit it all together, now we can really pay attention to the meaning of the individual words, uh, since now we know how they fit together. After all, if you think of one of the examples I gave you earlier, you know, just knowing that, that, you, get the, um, that you get the words um, um, dog, uh, chase, and cat is not enough for you to know who's chasing who, you need to know in which order and how these words connect in order to understand the meaning of the sentence. So the syntax first approach says you build this whole tree, how everything connects, and then you can fully interpret the sentence. Now, um, contrary to the syntax first approach, there is, however, some evidence that we seem to use the meaning of the words as we are reading, uh, as we are reading or listening to a sentence in real time. And, and Cruzwell and colleagues uh, nicely point, uh, pointed this out in an experimental setting. Um, so what they did is they presented participants with sentences and they looked at how long participants were, uh, were, were looking at each individual part of the sentence. And then they gave sentences um, that had different types of, that where some had ambiguities and some didn't. For example, take these two sentences. The defendant examined by the lawyer turned out to be unreliable. Now, as you read this, you might notice that the defendant examined is, uh, uh, is ambiguous. It could either be that the defendant was being examined by the lawyer, as you are, it could be, it could be the reflexive form um, as you're reading this in real time. So once you do say defendant examined, there are two possibilities. Either the defendant is being examined or the defendant 
was yesterday examining something, so past tense. Uh, and of course, once you get to buy, right, you understand that you 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 must um, uh, you must uh, uh, probably interpret it as the defendant was the person being examined. Um, in the second sentence, however, the evidence examined by the lawyer turned out to be unreliable. There's no such ambiguity. This can only be that somebody was examining the, the evidence. The evidence itself uh, is, isn't examining anything. It's, it's inanimate. Turns out people actually take different amount of times. People take longer to read this sentence in this initial part compared to this sentence. And yet up to here, up to examined, um, you, don't, you don't yet know, right, what's happening after. And so it does seem because people take systematically longer to read this, this sentence compared to that, it, it clearly indicates that people are taking into consideration the, the, the meaning of these two words, the fact that this one is animate and could either be the subject of the examining or the person examining something. Whereas here, of course, there's only one possibility. According to the syntax first approach, these two sentences should be read exactly in the same way because it's the same grammatical categories uh, in the same positions. So the two sentences are identical for that purpose as you first start reading it. Um, and yet we clearly treat these two sentences differently. So it must mean that as we read this, the fact that this is an animate versus this is inanimate is giving us indication, is giving us some suggestion as to what possible, what possible syntaxes, uh, syntax structures we could build out of them. And so it does seem like in real time, we actually are making use of this information as we read the sentences. Another wonderful um, example of this um, comes from Tannenhaus and colleagues. And they point out that Sure, um, you know, in the lab, we are only looking at a sentence and or we're listening to a sentence, but in real life, we actually use many other cues that are non-linguistic in nature, such as, you know, the context around us. And we use these to correctly understand what's happening and to interpret any type of ambiguity. So they did a, a very clever uh, experiment, uh, which was as follows. Participants heard sentences such as, put the apple on the towel in the box. Now, it's clear that the sentence is ambiguous because um, as you read it in real time, put the apple on the towel, by the time you get there, it, it's unclear if the apple is on the towel or if you want me to put an apple on a towel. Okay, so there clearly is an ambiguity to this. Uh, so as you're doing this in real time, it could be either of two possibilities. But here's the clever thing that they did. Um, Either participants were looking at, so participants heard this sentence and either they were looking at a layout that looked like this with an apple on a towel, then another towel and a box and a pencil, or they were looking at a layout where there were two apples, one on a towel, one on a napkin. And then they looked at where were people looking as they were hearing this sentence. Um, let me give you, let me, let's look at the first one as an example. So here you are, you're the participant, and you hear, put the apple in the towel on the box. And in real time, I, I, I track your eyes and I see where you're looking. So here's what happens. You hear, put the apple. So you're staring at the middle. And the first thing you do is, Whoop, I'm looking at the apple. Of course, it's the only apple there. So. And then you hear, on the towel. And so instinctively, the very first thing you do is say, okay, I, I guess I'm going to take this apple and I'll put it right there. And then you hear in the box and you go like, oh man, this doesn't make sense anymore. It's gotta be a garden path sentence. So you go back to the apple and you say, oh, you meant put the apple that is on the towel, put that one in the box. And now you look down to the box, okay? So this is clearly revealing that in this particular setup, you heard put the apple and you spontaneously assumed that we were asking you to put the apple on the towel, right? So this visual setup led you to that interpretation. Let's look at what happens when you have two apples. So here you are, same thing, you're staring in the middle and you hear, put the apple. 
Now, some people look at the apple up here, but we, we'll only we'll only look at the people who look at the apple down here. Okay. So, okay, uh, put the apples. All right, I'm going to look at the apple. And then you hear on the towel, and you go, oh, nope, I'm sorry, we we're talking about this apple. <laughs> right. So the interesting thing is that they didn't they didn't look at the towel as they did earlier, right? Uh, in this layout, in this configuration, participants spontaneously assumed that when, when you said put the apple and then on the towel, you meant, no, no, the apple that is on the towel. Okay? So just because of the different visual cues, participants are interpreting the syntax of, what, of the message that is coming in in a different way. Here, they interpreted put the apple on that towel. Because here, they spontaneously interpreted Put the apple that is on the towel, oh, into the box, All right? So this is a, a wonderful example of how not only we use syntax, as the syntax first approach says, we also use semantics, which is what you saw in the previous experiment, but we also use contextual cues. We use visual cues. We, we, we use knowledge from what's in front of us. In fact, as the book points out, we also use prosody and punctuation to try to understand what is the message. And see, this goes all back to, to the beginning of this class. Language is a very underspecified and ambiguous stimulus. So in order to understand what is being said, what is being conveyed, we make use of all sorts of cues. Of course, we make use of the syntax and uh, the categories of words that we're hearing, but we also make use of the semantics. Um, we make use of non-visual information. We make use of stuff that we already know. Remember the example, I show up in class and I say, huh, it rains. Well, nobody thought that it was raining inside the class. You know it doesn't rain in, inside a classroom. So you spontaneously eliminated that interpretation and thought, it's got to be raining outside. Language is so underspecified. There are so many possible interpretations of virtually any um, uh, uh, verbal message. We use all the information we have at our disposal in order to understand it. Again, computational complexity.